Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to talk about how to write an effective resume when you're seeking a legal uh, professional uh, position. So let's begin. It's first, uh, before we actually begin with the substance, let me cover a couple of things that I think are important when we talk about resumes. In many of the courses or the, the materials that we'll cover in this class and other classes, there will be times that I say, this is the right answer, and this is, you know, any other answer is just not right. Um, I'm not going to say that about resumes. Uh, you will discover in your career, if you haven't already, that uh, the resume writing process um, and the way that people evaluate resumes can be very subjective. And so virtually everything I say today, you'll probably find someone out there who will disagree with me in whole or in part. Um, for that reason, it's important to um, listen to lots of different people, to get lots of different perspectives, and to be open to evolving your opinion. What might be the way legal resumes are written today, it might be different in 10 years or even five years. Uh, so uh, constantly be reevaluating kind of where you are in that perspective perspective. Also talk to other legal professionals, um, both theoretically about resumes, but also share your resume with other legal professionals and get their feedback. And um, be aware that um, the only person at the end of the day who has to love your resume is your future employer <laughs> and you. And so if you get advice that doesn't seem right, that doesn't fit with what you want to do or what what makes you comfortable, then you ought to um, follow those instincts and do what is the best fit for you. So what I'm going to try to do in this presentation is not tell you my personal opinion about stuff, uh, but to give you what I think is a very mainstream approach. Um, in preparing for this, let me kind of give you a point of, of, of reference. Um, I've been a legal professional for over 25 years. Um, I have had I guess I've had three different, four different legal jobs, and I've applied for a few others at, at points in my career. Um, I have been involved in hiring uh, dozen, I would say at least two or three dozen attorneys at various points, and um, probably an equal number of um, legal secretaries and paralegals. And I've interviewed well over 100 attorneys and well over 100 paralegals. So I've seen lots of resumes, um, and I, I have a lot of experience both with my own reaction to the resumes as well as the reaction of other legal professionals. And that's one of the reasons I say it's so subjective. There have been times where I've seen a resume and thought it was awesome. And I've uh, had a colleague who really, really hated the resume. So um, I speak from a point of having a, a fairly significant amount of experience. In addition, in preparing for this presentation, I've talked to um, a job placement professionals who specialize in legal profession uh, job placement to get their perspective on what works and what they see um, law firms and legal departments uh, preferring. So I'm, my intention is to give very mainstream, very uncontroversial advice. Um, but again, even with all those caveats, you need to um, take what is useful for you and put aside what you feel doesn't make sense for you. So let's go ahead and begin. We're going to first of all in this presentation talk about big picture items, how to think about your resume and the job search process. Then we're going to talk about the mechanics, what goes where in your job resume. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about scenarios because the reality is no one has a perfect resume. If you are that one exception to the rule and you do have a perfect resume, wonderful, congratulations. You probably don't even have to worry about getting a job. They're going to find you on your own. But um, if you have something less than a perfect resume, you are in good company because um, everybody has a less than perfect resume. And we'll talk about some of the ways of handling um, issues that might be present in your resume. So let's begin with the big picture stuff. Um, I've kind of already covered this. You have to love your resume. No one else has to love your resume. Um, I like to say if you talk to four legal professionals about re legal resumes, you'll get five different pieces of advice. Another thing I, I want to say is that 
if you um, go on the internet and look for advice about resume writing, you'll get lots of it. Um, but much of it is going to be industry specific. So the advice that might get you a, uh, a position, say, as a, oh, I don't know, a, um, an advertising uh, person is going to be very different than the resume that's going to get you a job as a legal professional. Um, and so uh, uh, don't assume that every piece of advice you see on the internet is equally valid for every industry. There's lots of, of reasons why one industry might prefer a particular style or, or, or not a particular style. Play with your resume. Try different approaches. Look and, and Google different resume styles um, to see what speaks to you, what um, seems to be the most effective way of organizing and presenting the information that you want to, to present. Um, this is a picture, I think, of, of Mount Everest, and you can see uh, you have this group of people climbing the mountain, and it's going to feel that way in your job search from time to time. Um, there's a far way to go, and it's hard going, and at times you're probably going to be a little discouraged. Um, that's natural. That's part of the, the job search process, but keep in mind, you only need, in fact, you only want one job at a time, and so uh, reaching that summit um, sounds overwhelming, and you may have to put in your resume for 20, 30, 40 jobs before you get that one. Um, but that's okay because you're going to get there. Um, it's just a matter of, of staying with it, approaching it as a job. Finding a, your next job is a full-time job. It's going to involve um, you know, searching for positions. It's going to involve networking. It's going to involve working on your interview techniques. It's going to involve uh, polishing your cover letters and your resumes. Um, there's going to be lots of steps in the process. Um, it's easy to get fatigued. It's easy to get discouraged. But just keep in mind that you only need one job. And uh, it could be the very next interview you go on or the very next resume that you put in that's going to lead you to that job. So think of it as climbing Mount Everest. The hardest job you'll ever find is the first job in a new industry. So once you get that first job, it's downhill from that. You've reached the summit. You've reached the top of Mount Everest. And from that point on, it's going to be easier to find the next job and the next job and the next job. Um, it, it is a little bit like a marathon. I mean, you might luck into an awesome job in the first week. Certainly that happens. Um, or it may take you several, several weeks of trying. So keep in mind, uh, expect that the answer is going to be no much more often than the answer is going to be yes. Expect that you'll put your resume in for jobs and you'll never hear back from any employers. Should they respond with a thank you but no thank you message? Absolutely. Is it poor etiquette? Is it inconsiderate on their part? Absolutely. Is it going to happen to you? Absolutely. I, I regret to say there will be many times you submit your job application that you will never, ever hear back from that uh, possible employer. Um, in that situation, what should you do? Well, there's a few things you might want to think about. One is reaching out to that employer and saying, um, you know, thanks for considering me. I'm looking forward to meeting with you. Uh, can we set up a time for me to come in? Uh, some people are very comfortable with that approach. Some people are uncomfortable with it but are willing to do it. Other folks, that's just really, really outside of their comfort zone. Um, so uh, there are some alternatives. One can be a follow-up email. Um, hey, thanks for considering my resume. I just want to follow up and make sure you didn't have any questions. Um, when you're ready to schedule my interview, please uh, contact me or email me at, at this contact information. Uh, but a, a little follow-up uh, can, can sometimes be the difference between getting that interview and not getting the interview. Um, something that's a little bit harder to do, but maybe a little bit less scary than actually calling during business hours is to call outside of business hours and leave a voicemail message uh, so that they know that, that you continue to be interested. Um, you don't want to be a pest. You don't want to be in a situation where you're calling every day or you're calling several times a week. Um, but it does make sense to reach out, especially if a week has gone by and you haven't heard anything. Um, if for no other reason, you might be able to get some closure to your job application. And maybe you didn't get the job this time, but you might be um, considered more of a candidate the next time around and that they've, they've seen that you're, you're hungry, that you want the position. So there's a careful balance between uh, being persistent, being engaged, and being 
uh, creepy. You don't want to cross the line into creepy, but um, at least one uh, reaching out is very appropriate. Um, again, if you do reach somebody live, though, you want that to be a pleasant conversation. You don't want them to cringe. That You don't want them to think, oh my gosh, I can't believe she called me. You want it to be a super quick call that you're not pressuring. Hey, thanks for considering my resume. Just wanted to reach out and see if you had any questions. Um, oh, uh, you don't? Okay, well, just uh, hope to hear from you soon. Uh, let me just give you my, my telephone number and email address again. And um, if I'm a good candidate for you, for the position, I hope that you'll consider uh, contacting me. Short and sweet, and thanks so much. Goodbye. Um, don't pressure beyond that, or what you might find is you were going to get a call, but now you're not because they're scared. Well, if we interview this person and we don't want to hire them, uh, she might be calling us all the time. And so you, you, you want to stay on the comfortable side. Reach out, quick telephone call, no more than, say, two minutes, giving, not um, insisting that they give you an answer or anything along those lines, but just letting them know, I continue to be interested. Let's talk about the difference between the perfect legal job and the perfect for right now legal job. Um, unless you already have legal experience or you have a very um, impressive and relevant job experience um, in another industry that's going to really tie into the legal business pretty well, your first legal job is probably not going to be that perfect legal job. Um, frankly, you aren't ready for that perfect legal job in most cases. And so if you were to somehow stumble into that perfect legal job, it probably wouldn't be perfect for you. Probably be more stressful than you're ready for, more responsibility than you're ready for, and it might end up being, you know, an ulcer-inducing type of situation. So um, what you might be looking for at this point is a just-for-now legal job, something that you're planning on having for six months or a year. Um, it might be as a legal receptionist. It might be as a, a jack or Jane of all trades in a law firm. Maybe you're the only support staff in that law firm. So you are the paralegal and the receptionist and the file clerk and the courier um, and all those other functions rolled into one. Um, so be open to jobs that maybe don't have the word paralegal in it. Um, the, the just for now job uh, can provide you with a lot of cool things. Obviously, it's providing you with a paycheck, so that's a good thing. Um, but it also can get you lots of other things. Even if the job really isn't a paralegal job, simply having the name of a law firm or a legal department on your resume makes a huge difference for you getting your next job. Um, I'll tell you a story, and this is uh, a story from somebody who, uh, it's not his personal story, but it's a story of one of his friends. Um, this person has completed the program. I'm going to call this person Bob. That's not really his name, but for the sake of our example, Bob. Bob worked in the Washington, D.C. market. He had been an IT professional, and he decided he wanted to switch into the legal profession. And uh, he wanted to work uh, using his IT skills in the legal profession. Well, in the D.C. area, there are lots and lots of legal professionals. And so it was difficult for him to make that transition. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons he might have moved to Dallas, so that he, he felt he had a better chance. Anyway, he had one friend who's, who also wanted to make a similar transition, and that person was staying in the D.C. market. Well, that person for six months put in his resume after resume after resume for a um, a legal position that would use his IT uh, background. And he rarely even got an interview. And he rarely even got a no thank you letter. He would just kind of send out emails and send out letters and hear nothing. And as you can imagine, that was very demoralizing, very difficult. He wasn't thinking he was getting anywhere. I mean, he really wasn't getting anywhere. He finally got, though, an interview, and it actually resulted in a job. You know, he couldn't have been more excited. He went to work that Monday morning, and it just wasn't good at all. And by Wednesday, the employer said, this is not working out. You need to go now. <laughs> and so um, this friend, I'll call the friend Phil, this, this friend named Phil, um, was out of a job three days of working and you can imagine he was even more demoralized than he was when he had never gotten a job because at least before he got the job he thought well once I get the job it'll be okay but now he had gotten the job and it hadn't been okay and so he was uh, 
I, I back in square one, back writing up his resume and sending it out. And you know, his first thought was, I'm just not even going to mention this three day uh, fiasco um, on his on my resume. Um, but then he thought to himself, you know what? Why not just give it a try? Why not stick it on there? I mean, I've I've tried for six months and haven't gotten anything. Let me just try half of my resumes. I'm going to put this three day. Um, law firm experience on and half I'm gonna just go with my old resume and um, he found that the resumes that he had his three-day job experience on he oftentimes actually got an interview out of it and ultimately he that led to a job so the point is that even if it's very very little legal experience having the name of a law firm on your resume moves you from one category of employability to another so that just for now, um, job, even if it isn't a paralegal job, can tremendously improve your chances of getting a paralegal job. Um, so that's a, a key benefit to uh, that first legal job. Another key benefit is that it's going to help you figure out what you want to do as a paralegal. Uh, do you want to work in a small law firm or a big law firm? Do you want to uh, work in a litigation office or in a more of an office practice environment? Are you comfortable with family law? Do you like to do wills? Um, what is your criminal law preps is your thing? You, uh, having a theoretical idea about what you want to do is lovely and wonderful, but the reality of it may be quite different. And so figuring that part out can be um, a, a very helpful uh, uh, thing to do during that first job, if it's possible. And then another advantage, I guess the fourth advantage to that, to that first job is um, that See, I went blank on the fourth advantage. <laughs> Let me pause here and think for a second what that fourth advantage is. It will come to me in a minute. I will go forward and, um, oh, I know what the fourth advantage is. Many times that just for now legal job can grow into the perfect legal job because you have a whole new set of networks that are going to develop out of a legal job. Um, and so that attorney who's hired you to, to be the receptionist um, may know of other openings when you're ready for the next move. Um, and, uh, or it may be that the attorney's practice is growing just as you are developing skills. And so uh, maybe that attorney will promote you to being paralegal. So because it's a just for now job right now doesn't mean it will always be a just for now job. It can definitely transition. So those are some reasons to, especially for the first job, to, to go for ones that maybe aren't the perfect job. Now your situation might be different. You might be um, employed in another industry where you have a significant income and so you might really want to wait for that perfect legal job or at least um, a, a very solid a legal job and that's also very reasonable to do. Um, after you've completed a semester in the program, in fact before you complete a semester program, you are very employable in the legal business. You are probably not going to get a job that is truly a paralegal job until you've gone into the program to, to a greater extent, but you can definitely get a legal job um, even at, in the very, very early stages of your career if you're interested in doing that. Of course, if you're already earning a significant income in a different industry, you may well want to wait until you've completed the paralegal program and have that credential so that you can leverage that into um, a more traditional paralegal position earning a higher amount of, of higher level of income. Okay, big picture. One of the things that um, is so helpful when you're looking at the job search process is to step into the shoes of the employer. What is the employer thinking? What are his or her uh, frustrations, concerns? Typically when an employer um, posts an ad or puts out feelers saying that he or she wants to hire someone, he or she is, is likely to get lots of resumes. Well, why did the person put out the feeler to begin with? Typically, it's because they had too much work. Um, and so they were already overwhelmed with work. And now they have this other job they have to do, which is to find somebody to hire. And so when they look at that stack of 100 resumes or 50 resumes or whatever, um, they have to decide yes or no. Am I interviewing this person or am I not interviewing this person? And every person they say yes to is going to take up at least 
an hour, probably more of their time with the interview. And so typically they want to interview as few as they can get away with, um, while at the same time making sure that they're gonna get somebody good out of it. So when they're going through that stack of resumes, they are very much predisposed to saying no, because yes eats up their very precious time. So your job when you are writing your resume is to figure out how to get into that first, that initial yes stack. And the test here that most employers are gonna use, um, they don't know they have this test, but this is the reality of what they do is they look at resumes for about three to five seconds. Yes, I am not kidding when I say that. They look at the resume, they scan it, and if they don't see something they love, it's going into the no stack. If they see something they like, then they spend more time looking at it, and then maybe they spend a minute. They may still say no, but at least you've crossed that first hurdle. So you want to pass that three to five second test. One thing I recommend that you do when you get your resume to a pretty fine point is share it with your significant other or your family member or a good friend and say, look at this resume and time them. Give them no more than five seconds and ask them, what did you see on it? What were the things you took away from it? And if they see that you used to walk dogs and you love to play Parcheesi, that's not a good resume. <laughs> Those are two things that are not going to get you a job as a paralegal. You want them to leave that five, three to five seconds thinking, seeing your legal stuff and seeing a, a, probably the two impressions that are probably most important are attractive professional, attractive resume, professional resume, legal stuff is on it. Those three impressions are what you want the person to leave the resume with. And so testing your, doing this yourself and having other folks looking at it can be a really good idea. Will a beautiful resume get you a job that you're not the right person for? Probably not. I'm not gonna say it's impossible that it will, but in most cases, no. Uh, if you don't have the experience that is being sought, um, you're probably not gonna get the resume even if you have a magnificent resume. Having a bad resume though will very often disqualify you even if you would have been a good candidate. So a resume is a very crucial document. It's a, a good resume is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to getting that job. Okay, um, so things that might disqualify you um, during those three to five seconds. Uh, the, 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 the person looking at the resume sees a typo. The person the resume doesn't see something legal quickly. Uh, the person the resume doesn't like the format. There's something wrong about it in their mind. It's not like the other resumes. Um, it might be a really nice format for another profession, but it doesn't seem to fit with what this person is used to seeing. There can be other silly reasons. Um, I'm not going to defend these reasons, and we'll talk about some of them later on, but it can be something as simple as, hmm, I'm not sure if this is a man or a woman. I don't even know how to email this person back because I'm not sure if it's a man or I don't care whether it's a man or a woman, but gosh, it's gonna be an awkward email to send. Well, it's just easier to say no, or really not even say no, just not respond to it. Or I don't know how to pronounce that last name. Oh, that's gonna be embarrassing. How do I talk with a person and not stumble over their name? Well, it's just easier not to interview that person. Be aware that those are out there as, as things that can be stumbling issues. Again, should they be? No. It's silly. It's wrong. Sometimes it's unlawful to make those kind of decisions. But people are human, and people have comfort zones. And one of your jobs as the potential employee is to figure out a way to become that employee, to overcome some of those barriers that might exist. And we'll talk about some of those approaches in the, in the third half. Uh, third part of our presentation. Another thing that sometimes it, uh, potential um, employees mess up on is they don't rework the resume. I will tell you how things were when I was in um, in college. When I left, when I graduated from college, um, that was in the the late '80s, and I um, uh, people would would print uh, the resumes. They would uh, uh, you know type it up. And, and get them printed up. 
And so you would have three or four resumes maybe for the three or four types of jobs you have and, and you wouldn't tweak it every time because it was a pretty big deal to, to do that. Most people would, would, you have to start from the beginning and type up the whole thing and if you had a typo, you'd have to restart the resume. So um, there wasn't a lot of tweaking. Nowadays, of course, with Word and other word processing tools, it is so incredibly easy to tweak a resume. There really is no excuse for using the same resume more than one time. There's always going to be something that you can do to make your resume be a little bit better for that next position. So seriously, seriously consider it. You may have two or three kind of standard resume formats, and then there's just a little bit of changes that you make to each uh, resume. So definitely consider that each time. Typos are a no-go. Um, even having a single typo can cause you not to be considered for a position. Um, I have heard that time and time again that, you know, that the reader will get to, you know, 80% of the resume and be thinking, of course, this person's awesome, and then see the typo. And then, oh, no. Now, you may be thinking, well, why is a typo such a big deal? This is the logic behind it. Legal professionals mainly rely upon the written word. That is the product that they're producing. You know, if we were uh, Ford or um, uh, Lexus or Honda or Toyota, what we produce is a car. And so um, we want our car, we, they, would, they would care about uh, this person's skill at making a car if you were being hired into those positions. For a legal professional, it's all about the use of words. And uh, especially for a paralegal, much of it is about do you know how to maneuver in the legal industry? And one of the, the important skills in the legal industry is knowing how to dress up your, 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 your legal writing, knowing how to present it. And um, the, the, the cover letter and the resume, the, the potential employee has the most incentive, more than any other point in that relationship, to make those documents gorgeous. And if you have a typo, then the legal professional, I mean, the, the, the potential employer thinks, hmm, he has a typo when he's preparing this document for his own benefit. How many typos is he going to have in the documents I ask him to prepare? I can't trust him to have perfect documents, and imperfect documents expose uh, me to embarrassment and possibly to, to legal problems with my clients and maybe with opposing counsel and other people. It's not acceptable to have uh, typos routinely in legal documents. I mean, they happen. I'm not going to say they never happen, but boy, somebody who has a typo on their resume just isn't trustworthy to provide beautiful legal documents, and that's what I want for my paralegal. So you just can't have them. You just can't. You have to check and check and recheck, and you probably have to have somebody else read it too. Um, so you want to make sure that you have those things uh, taken care of. Um, I will be honest with you, I review resumes all the time for students, and I am delighted to, use, to uh, review yours. Um, I, am, I, think, I think I'm very, very nice when I do resume reviews. It is my goal to be completely non-intimidating. And I will tell you, though, that um, I would say at least 80% of the time, a student who brings in a resume has a typo in it. It's probably more like 90%. They happen all the time. Um, and that, I, I love it when students bring in the resumes with typos because I'll see it and then we can solve it. And now they've moved from a definite no to a, a very possible yes. I can give that kind of assistance. Now, that's not something that's unique to me. I mean, anyone can find a typo. I don't have any particular you know, typo sensing skills, but um, it is so important that you, you check for that kind of stuff, and sometimes it requires a different set of eyes to find it. Let's go to the next slide. I, this haiku, um, you won't obviously have a haiku in your resume, um, but uh, I like to think about, uh, sometimes I like to use haikus myself just to kind of frame my thinking, because haikus, as you probably remember from um, when you maybe were in an English course, they're short poems um, 
the, the style is Japanese and each there's three lines and each line has a different number of syllables um, and so this is an example of, of how what you might do with a resume haiku and this is what a, a resume haiku might read like anticipates what attorneys and clients need and find solutions that's what a, a, re, a resume ought to do so let's kind of uh, pull this apart the first word I think is important is anticipates your job when you're writing that resume and your cover letter is to jump into the position of the hiring attorney what is on his mind and what is on his mind he may not even know your job is almost to predict what he's going to think even if he doesn't know what he's going to think um, many paralegals out there will tell you hey that's the job description for a paralegal to be one step ahead of the attorney so to the extent that you can develop those skills at the very beginning boy it's going to be golden for you going going forward and so that's what I'm talking about in terms of kind of anticipating uh, stepping into that attorney's shoes and seeing what's on his or her mind and then of course you're focusing on the attorney in most law firms it's going to be the attorney who makes hiring decisions sometimes it could be an office manager or a, a paralegal manager but most of the time it's going to be an attorney and of course the attorney is thinking about who's going to make my life easier but he's also thinking about who's going to help me uh, meet my clients needs and who's going to help me keep clients who's going to help me bring more clients in and then this is a big part the word solutions you know virtually any time where an employer is looking for a new employee they have a problem and they are hiring somebody in the hopes that that person will be the solution to the problem uh, that's not unique to paralegal hiring but it is my opinion that probably the idea of a solution to a problem is even more important to uh, paralegals than it might be um, to other uh, jobs that are being found um, let's kind of think about that for a little bit why does an employer want to hire a paralegal well sometimes it's because an opening has happened maybe the current paralegal has resigned or been fired or um, or something along those lines so sometimes it's just a uh, we need it to replace a person uh, but even in that situation it, the, the employer is predicting that they have too much work given their their fu anticipated future staffing um, oftentimes there's just too much chaos law offices can be very stressful places in most law offices at least the ones that are successful the attorney is going to be working lots of hours has lots of deadlines has lots of plates in the air that they're trying to balance and it's a quite a stressful situation and so they're constantly attorneys are constantly um, afraid of dropping something forgetting something missing a deadline um, that is always kind of in the back of the mind and oftentimes in the front of the mind I'll tell you a personal story for me um, I left uh, a large law firm uh, Baker and Botts uh, after practicing there about three years I guess a little over three years let me think here no, I guess it was a little, about two two to two and a half years a little I guess it's more like two and a half years maybe anyway um, but uh, you know not a super long time and um, I went to work for JC Penney in their legal department uh, working in-house is a much less stressful environment for legal professionals than working in a, in a large law firm I loved my time at Baker Botts I had a wonderful experience but it was much more stressful after I left Baker Botts for months afterwards I would wake up in the middle of the night two and three in the morning in a cold sweat thinking I missed a deadline um, and it was simply the the the, the stress of, of having all those deadlines in my practice and, and still kind of working through that anxiety that's not an uncommon thing and many times the, the attorney is looking for the, um, the the paralegal to be the deadline uh, keeper to be the person that they can say I'm making you responsible for this make sure I know about deadlines well enough advance to satisfy them so I can sleep at night you make sure that I'm going to be okay in this area that's a position of incredible trust um, you are probably not going to be that person on the first day you're going to have to earn that role 
but many times that's what the attorney is looking for somebody that he can he or she can say I can sleep tonight because my paralegal would have told me if there was a deadline I needed to worry about and so developing that kind of relationship is so important and being the kind of person that the attorney when he interviews you can say I can imagine that that interviewee could be that person for me at some point that is golden that is huge so you so presenting yourself as that well-organized on top of things uh, responsible dependable person is so so important um, then there's a lot of management I'm going to tell you a secret about attorneys um, as soon as I say this you know you you will have had a known attorney who this doesn't fit with at all and that is true I've, I've certainly known attorneys who this is not at all true for but in my opinion I would say 70% maybe even more of attorneys are kind of disorganized people I certainly am a disorganized person um, part of that is that they have so much things so many things to do so so many uh, plates in the air it would be a challenge for anyone to remain organized with all those things going on but I think there is also kind of a temperament of an attorney that um, is a little bit of that absent-minded professor kind of person and so many attorneys need somebody who is that organized person to kind of manage them I'm not going to say an attorney is, is like Albert Einstein, but I'm going to draw a little bit of comparison with Albert Einstein. I don't know if this is a true story or, or a legend about him, but uh, there is a story out there that when he worked in New York City, um, he actually would have somebody walk him from his apartment to his office because um, he was thinking so many great thoughts that he would get lost and he would just kind of wander around the city obviously he was a brilliant man he wasn't too dumb to know how to get from his office to his apartment and vice versa but he would just have so many thoughts going on that he would lose track of where he is i'm not saying that the attorneys with whom you are going to work are as brain as albert einstein very unlikely obviously but some of that can some of that temperament you can see in some attorneys and they need somebody who are going, is going to hold their hand <laughs> and walk them to the office and get them in the right seat and get them working on the right stuff and so again the attorney is kind of looking for that person are they going to say that are they going to say in that interview I'm messy I'm disorganized I need you to hold my hand probably not that's not something most people are ever going to be very proud of um, but I mean there'll be some that will say that but, but most of them aren't going to admit to that um, they may not even admit to that in the first few weeks of, of the working relationship um, but it, it's a pretty safe bet that there's some of that going on and so even though the person with whom you're interviewing may not be saying those things keep in mind that that may be a subtext so you want to be that person who is on the money who's organized who's on time who keeps track of things uh, be that person be that trustworthy person many times attorneys hire the paralegal to be the gatekeeper um, you may have heard jokes at points in your life where um, you know somebody passes away and they go to the pearly gates and uh, St. Peter is there and he asks that whomever has passed away questions to see whether they get into heaven or not well that's the idea of a gatekeeper somebody who kind of protects the attorney I'm not saying the attorney is God or the attorney is heaven but um, the idea is kind of there that um, the paralegal handles uh, routine calls and lets the attorney focus on the legal work the billable work um, obviously the attorney oftentimes does need to be involved in calls and other things but many times the, the attorney wants the paralegal to uh, be that first contact and so being uh, presentable being professional in one's demeanor and the way one speaks and the way one dresses is an important thing that, that uh, uh, the attorney may be looking for the paralegal may want somebody who can keep the office running especially if it's a small law firm uh, the paralegal is often excuse me the attorney is oftentimes looking for an office manager in addition to a paralegal somebody who can um, make sure that the bills are paid that the clients get their bills that um, when the photocopier breaks down somebody from the company comes out and services it that there's always enough pens and pencils and pads of paper on on hand um, 
all of those office -y things may fall to the paralegal to do. And the attorney doesn't want to be in a position of saying to the paralegal, paralegal, you need to order more pads of paper. That attorney, if he's assigned that job to the paralegal, wants there just to be paper there. He doesn't want to ever go to the, um, the supply cabinet and there's no pads of paper. And so he is expecting that person to be proactive. He wants to trust that person to be able to manage the, the file cabinet and say, yeah, we are down to three pads of paper, probably need to order some more. So those are some things to think about. And as you know what the attorney is thinking about, it's going to help you be the person who's going to meet that expectation. Now you'll notice on this list, I haven't really talked about any of the skills, the traditional skills that we talk about being paralegal, for example, being a good writer, being a good legal researcher. Obviously those are important, very important. And if you don't have those, you're probably not going to get the job. Um, but you either have those skills or you don't. Having these personality characteristics um, can be um, every bit as important, seems more important than having the technical job skills. Let me give you an example from uh, my um, experience. Um, I have worked with so many awesome paralegals in my life. There was a period of time in my career that I had uh, two paralegals with whom I worked, and I uh, thought the world of both of them. I'm going to call them Bob and Mary. Um, Bob was an amazing writer. I mean, excellent, excellent writer. And most of Bob's and Mary's job as paralegals was to write. Uh, they did other tasks, but writing was a huge part of both of their jobs. And, um, you know, really Bob was an extraordinary writer. Um, so his writing was always a pleasure to read. I almost never needed to make any changes. And it wasn't just that it was something that needed to be changed. It was just really good inherently. Mary was also a good writer, a solid writer, and I had to make very few changes to her writing. It wasn't quite as brilliant as Bob's, though, I'll be honest with you. Um, they were both very skilled in their job. They both did a very good job performing their job tasks. But you know what? Um, if if some, some attorney came to me today and said, hey, um, uh, both Mary and Bob applied to work in my law firm, which one should I hire? And let's say this was a buddy, and uh, the, the attorney and I, I really wanted to help them out. I would tell them, hire Mary. And let me tell you why. Even though Bob is probably somewhat better uh, in terms of, of his technical skills, Bob had two problems. And these weren't deal breakers. I mean, Bob wasn't ever fired from a job, and, and I would hire Bob again. But I would hire him with some hesitation because he had two problems. One problem was that Bob sometimes missed work. He didn't miss work often. I mean, obviously, he took vacation and things like that. You know, I, I'm not talking about that, those kind of misses. But I mean, the I can't come to work because I'm not feeling well type of, of absences. Um, he might have two or three of those a year. I mean, he wasn't excessive. But these were absences that, he really didn't need to have. In fact, as soon as he called them mental health days, um, he wasn't really too sick to come. I'm not going to say he was never too sick to come, but he just, he needed a day off. Well, that's why you have Saturdays and Sundays. A paralegal needs to be at work Monday through Friday, every Monday through Friday, unless he has a planned day off. Unless he's really, really, really Really, 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 let me say that five more times. Really, 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 really sick. You don't miss work. You just don't miss work. Because the attorney's like, but this is my gatekeeper. This is my deadline manager. Who's, who's guarding the chicken coop at this point in time? You have to be there every day. If you miss a day, You've, you're beginning to chip away at that trust relationship. It's not something you can afford to do. Now, if you're throwing up and you got a temperature of 103, okay, yeah, you have to miss it. But if that's happening two or three or four times a year, 
you need to get some vitamin C, you need to figure out a way to get that going in a better way. Um, you definitely, if you're in that situation, you definitely need to work for a larger law firm because you need to have someone to be able to cover for you under those circumstances. Um, messing work is just not an option as a, as a legal professional unless it's really, really bad. So think about that carefully. The, your employer is not going to have a lot of sympathy or a lot of tolerance for missing work. You need to be there. And Bob, again, was it excessive? No, probably didn't miss more than three or four days a year, but they were unexpected. And um, most of the days of our practice, we had things we had to file that day. And so I had to figure out what Bob needed to file that day and where the documents were and where he was with them. And um, I was scurrying around doing stuff that was his work when I should have been doing my work. And that's not a good thing. That's not an acceptable thing to happen, except when it's really, really essential. Um, so that was one problem with Bob. The other problem with Bob is Bob sometimes didn't get along with his coworkers. Um, he had kind of a love-hate relationship with several of his coworkers. He loved them until he didn't love them, and then he really didn't like them. And he wasn't always very diplomatic in those relationships. I'm sure sometimes the, the, those coworker did say something or do something that was inappropriate. I, Bob wasn't, you know, unreasonable uh, generally. I mean, he wasn't a crazy guy. He was, he was reasonable. But it seemed like he was always having this kind of tiff with this person or that person. Um, again, not necessary. You need to be the person who gets along with everybody else. You need to suck it up. You need to be the grown-up. You need to say, oh, that person's just crazy. I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to, okay, that person's having a bad day. I am moving on. I'm being the grown-up in this situation. Um, we don't need office drama, and don't be that person. Because I promise you, the second person that you have the office drama with, you are now, in everybody's mind, the drama person in the office. Even if you really aren't, you can't afford to be that person. It's very hard to lose that kind of reputation. So those were Bob's two problems. Let me tell you about Mary, though. Mary was very, very competent paralegal. I don't think she ever missed a day that she did have a, I mean, she took her vacation, things like that, but I don't think she ever missed a day. And if she did, boy, we knew she was really sick. And she was probably still working from home a little bit. And she didn't miss a day where, unless it was a day that she could really, really afford to miss. And everybody liked uh, uh, Mary. Everybody got along with Mary. Mary never caused anybody any tension. So that's what I'm saying. You want to be technically good. But gosh, almost as much as that, you want to be dependable and a team player. Those are huge issues. Now, I'm saying all this, and you can't really put that on your resume. I mean, you can, you can list on your resume, don't miss, you know, haven't missed a day of work in the last three years or whatever. And that's really powerful to put if you can say that truthfully. Um, but, you know, it, it's not really that useful to say I'm a team player or things like that, because guess what? Nobody says on the resume, I'm not a team player. And a lot of people who aren't team players think they are. Um, if I were to have Bob here, as much as I love Bob, and I do love Bob to this day, um, Bob didn't have the self-knowledge about these things. And he would say, oh, Gruber, you're you know, no, that, that wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so uh, saying that you, you get along with everybody and saying that you're a team player doesn't mean that you're going to have credibility. But how you present yourself. So, for example, if I'm in a job interview and um, maybe I, I left an employment situation because I didn't get along with my boss, boy, I definitely don't want to say, well, I left that place because that boss was unreasonable. Because I promise you, even if you are completely correct about that, um, because that um, employer, your, the, the person that you're interviewing with doesn't know, they're going to think, ah, oh, it was a problem with this interviewee. They were the reason why the relationship didn't work out. That will be the assumption that's made. So you have to be so diplomatic. Even for that crazy boss you had, you have to make it sound like, I, I, I can work with anybody. I can work with no matter who the person is. Um, law offices can be sources of a fair amount of drama. 
And even if the personnel in the law office aren't dramatic, boy, clients can be dramatic. And so even if the attorney says, well, you know, we can handle a bit of a prima donna with respect to my staff because they can roll with the punches, the attorney may well say, but you know what, my clients, you know, I'm a divorce attorney and my clients are going through difficult, difficult, difficult times and many of them are just crazy uh, as they're going through this time. And so they need somebody who's stable, who can roll with the punches, who um, will be that stabilizing influence. And so you need to present yourself as that rock solid adult who's going to be fine with what happens, who can roll with the punches. Okay. Uh, I've already kind of shared some of the ugly truth about attorneys. Um, attorneys, on the good side, they're usually quite smart, usually quite well educated, but they do deal with a lot of stress and they typically do work a lot of hours. They don't have a lot of training about how to manage things. Um, they oftentimes don't have a lot of skill with time management or organization. Um, and so, and also sometimes they don't have skills with computers. So these things are lacking. These are essential things to running a business. And so if they don't have them, they are looking for somebody who can exhibit those behaviors. And so they're, they're look, even if they don't ask questions, you want to leave that interview with that attorney thinking, boy, this person is a good manager. Boy, this person is really organized. Boy, this person is good at time management. Boy, this person has computer skills. So when you answer questions, think about inserting these types of ideas in your answers. Okay, so we've talked about big picture things, how to think about your resume, how to think about your interviews. Now we're going to talk about the mechanics, where things go and how you should present it. Okay, what do you want your resume to say? Well, you want it to kind of screen these ideas. I'm competent. Um, I'm detail-oriented. I'm professional. I'm well-organized. I'm trustworthy. So the type of resumes that you're going to prepare are going to be boring. I mean, I'll, I'll use the word right now. Boring screams competent. Boring screams professional. They're not going to be flashy. You're not going to have 12 different fonts. You're not going to have your picture. You're not going to have a ton of, of special symbols and all kinds of, of decorations. It's not going to be flashy. You don't want flashy. Flashy is not the same thing as competent. So keep that in mind. You want something that's going to look like what would grandma look at and, and expect to see in a resume? We're going traditional here. You want about a one inch margin around your document. Um, you are going to want to have a fair amount of white space on your document. This is especially uh, good during your, your first, you know, position or two that you're seeking in the legal business. You want places so that the interviewer can make notations. White space on the document also is aesthetically pleasing. If it's too cluttered, if there's too much stuff, everything gets lost in the, in the mess. If you find that you are looking for ways of getting enough content, you can actually shrink these margins. I, I, I definitely wouldn't go to two inches, but you might go to, you know, 1.2, possibly even 1.5. That might be a little bit much, but um, I would not go below one inch around your, your legal document. Uh, you know, if you have to drop to 0.9, I'm not saying it's a crime against nature, but you don't really want to go that extent. You want to have a one-page resume. I have been in the legal profession for over 25 years. My resume is one page. I don't mean to say it's impossible that you need more than one page, but it would be rare that you would at this point in your career. And honestly, it would probably be rare that you need one even at any point in your career. So definitely err on the side of one page. Keep in mind that in those three to five seconds, your um, uh, reviewer isn't going to get to the second page. So if it's not on the first page, um, it probably isn't going to really help you get the interview. Um, and so if you decide you want two-page resume, make sure that the second page has relatively unimportant stuff. And then, of course, the question is, well, if it's relatively unimportant, why are you bothering having it? Uh, that three to five second rule means you know, your brain can only uh, process 
a limited amount of data during that time. And if you have 10 important pieces of data, um, they might be able to see three or four or five of those. If you have 30 important pieces of data, you're now kind of leaving it up to randomness what that um, uh, reader is going to see. They might read the three or four most important pieces of data, or they might read something that's not so important. You have uh, The more content you have, the less you can control how that reader is going to use the three to five seconds. You want to use Times New Roman font. Let me spend a second and, and, and talk a little bit about this font. It's going to take me a minute to uh, do this. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Okay, so we are into Word. Um, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to show you a few different fonts. We're going to start with Arial. A lot of people like it. I'm going to choose a relatively large font so we can see the features of it. And let me go even bigger than that. We'll go to 28. So I'm going to type, I love New York. That is how Arial looks. Arial, and you can see the name for it is up here. Arial um, is designed to look very much like handwriting. If I were writing, I, my handwriting would look pretty much like that. Um, and this style is called, I'm just gonna write in parentheses what we're using here. This is Arial, and an Arial is a sans serif font. What does sans serif mean? Well, in uh, French, sans means without. And serif are the little curly cues on letters. I'll show you in a second what those look like. So an Arial is a font without the little hats and, and, and tails and, and little uh, uh, dashes and, and things on the, the, the various letters. It mimics how our handwriting looks. As a result, it looks more informal. We don't want informal. Informal may work if you're going for a job in a different profession. So I'm not saying um, if you decide to enter a different industry that Arial might not be the perfect font to use. Arial isn't an evil font. It's just not a good font for illegal stuff. Okay? Well, let me show you how Times New Roman works. So I switch it to Times New Roman, still at 28 point. And I'm going to say, I love New York. And we're going to do Times New Roman, and this is a serif font. And we can see here, I'm going to blow this up even bigger so you can see what I'm talking about when I say this. And I'll compare it to this one right here. So you can see that the um, Arial capital I is just aligned straight down. But the Times New Roman is wearing a little hat, and it has little feet down here. And you can see with the L in love, it also is just a dash down. In fact, you can see it looks identical to the capital I. But when we have the um, lowercase l, you can see the lowercase l in Times New Roman is different than the uppercase I. These two look the same. These two look different. That's pretty huge because, again, you have three to five seconds. This is hard to read, especially when you're using these letters. This reads itself. Um, now, you know, are, are legal professionals so stupid that they can't read this font? Of course not. But the, if you can make their job slightly more easy, awesome. That's good for you. I mean, it's good for them too, but that's a win-win situation. You want their job to be as easy as possible. Let me show you a classic. Let's say that I'm writing Illinois, the state, right? Make this even bigger. You can see that the difference between the capital I and our lowercase l's is non-existent. Well, there is a little difference. You can see that um, Arial spaces the capital I a little bit more, so the dis distance between the capital I and the first L is greater than the distance between the first L and the second L. But otherwise, the letters are the same. Now let me type out Illinois using Times New Roman. And you can see 
there's no way you're going to confuse these letters. And so it just makes it that much easier for the reader. And again, this looks more formal. It looks more like typesetting. Um, and that is what legal professionals are, are used to seeing, are wanting to see. So use Times New Roman. Now, uh, so you and definitely use a font with serifs. Could you use another one? Um, yeah, you could use Garamond. Let me pull up Garamond so you can see what that's like. But I guess what I return to is why? Let me just type in, I love New York. This is Garamond. I'm going to shrink it to a smaller font so I can keep it in one line. Garamond. This is a serif font. And I'm going to type Illinois in it. So, you know, Garamond looks, looks fine. It, it accomplishes the same stuff that we're accomplishing with uh, Times New Roman. But the thing of it is, and it's actually pretty similar to Times New Roman, but the thing of it is, um, legal professionals see Times New Roman all the time. The odds of someone being offended by Garamond, pretty darn small. The odds of them being offended by Times New Roman, basically non-existent. Why take a risk? Why even take that slight risk? Stick with something that you know is safe, and Times New Roman is definitely safe. I know legal professionals, if they get a, an aerial resume, even if it's perfect, they just don't like it. And you have got, you've given yourself one strike, maybe two strikes, before they've even read the document. So it's silly, it's ridiculous, I am not defending that, but you know what, you want a job. And why sabotage your effort to have a job by using a font that isn't gonna work? When you're doing your resume, you want to choose one font. Now you may choose to use bold in places, you may want to choose to use italics in places, you may want to use some underlining in places. Um, you may want to use small caps in places. There's lots of different tools that you may want to use within that font. Awesome, great, use them all. But stick with one font. And the same font you use in your uh, resume is the same font you're going to use in your cover letter. Just stick to one. Uh, are there ways of mixing fonts that can be lovely? Absolutely. But there are some people who think mixing fonts is like wearing plaids and stripes at the same time. They don't like it. And you don't know what the views of that person are going to be. And so why take a risk? Pick a font, and again, pick Times New Roman, and stick with it. That's your safest bet. A resume writing is all about being safe. So now I'm going to flip back to our PowerPoint. It's going to take me a second to get back on there. So here we are. We'll want to use 12 or 13 point um, with our PowerPoint and you can see up here this is actually in in, in, uh, in uh, our PowerPoint thing but, but if we were in Word we'd have the same screen and we would just bring this down to 12 or 13. You won't have a button for 13 but you would just type that in right there to, to get the right size. And actually, I think I probably had 20 here before, so I'm gonna go back to that. Um, you could go up to 14 for headings and things like that, uh, but these are good fonts to use. Now, you might be tempted to drop to a 10 or 11 point. I strongly discourage you from doing that. Let me tell you why. Um, I am um, a mature person, and I, uh, I'm old enough, and usually the, the age is probably in the mid-40s, where one's vision starts not being so cooperative. And so uh, people need to have bifocals. They need to um, have glasses that are going to allow them to have close-up vision. When you shrink your font, you're making it harder for that mature person to read the writing unless they put on their bifocals. Some people wear glasses all the time and or contacts all the time that have the bifocals built in, so it's not a big deal. Some people refuse to get them, they're vain, they're, they're not ready for it, and so you are making it more difficult for them to read the content when you put it down to a 10 or 11 point. If they can't read it in those three to five seconds, in other words, it has to almost read itself, then you are sinking yourself. So, if you, um, 
if you shrink it to 11 points and put more content, um, you are jeopardizing the readability for that person who's the, probably the hiring person is going to be in that age category. And, and so why do that? Why shoot yourself in the foot? Figure out a way to keep it at 12 or 13 point. Um, keep your, but so you, you, you do want to use some visual interest. Indentations, uh, lots of white space, use bold, use underlining, use bullets, use italics. Um, but only use black ink and only use white paper. Don't use photos, don't use graphics, don't make it too busy. Don't make there's too, make too many things going on in your writing. Make it uh, crisp and professional looking. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about mechanics. There's going to be typically four regions in your resume. You're gonna have your contact information, that's always gonna be at the top. Then you're going to have these three components. You're gonna have education somewhere below the top, work experience somewhere below the top, and probably some other skill section. We'll talk about how you order these in a couple of minutes. Um, after your contact information, you're also gonna have a section that's gonna be some kind of, of summary, most likely. Um, I'll tell you what my philosophy of this is, and, and there are people that have differing thoughts about this one. So this is, you remember I started by saying, um, talk to lots of people about your resume. This is one of these areas where there's a difference of opinion. I'm gonna tell you my philosophy, and then talk to, and I'll, I'll try to summarize what some other people think, but talk to other people who, who share different perspectives on that, or have different perspectives. Okay, so we're gonna talk about contact information first. You're gonna to wanna to have a professional name. Uh, when I do my resume, I use Cynthia Ferris Scriver. Um, my, uh, Ferris is my maiden name. I uh, sometimes use that professionally in addition to my, uh, my surname now. But I, I, I use it, or I continue to use it in part because I practiced law as Cynthia Ferris for many years before I got married. And so it could well be that somebody will recognize Cynthia Ferris within that law firm, because uh, I don't necessarily know everyone who's, who's there, and, and remember me there. So it's useful for me to keep that there uh, because of that connection. That doesn't mean that you have to use your middle name. Um, before I got married, my name was Cynthia Gale Ferris. I probably wouldn't use Gale. Gale is my main name. I might have done Cynthia G. Ferris. Using a middle initial uh, communicates a certain level of formality. And so I don't think it's a bad thing to use at all. But there's nothing wrong with going with Cynthia Ferris or, for that matter, Cynthia Groover. I do not like Cynthia. It is not a name that I've particularly cared for. So I usually go by Cindy. Having said that, I have never submitted a resume with Cindy Ferris, would never do so. That's not, for at least me, what I would consider a professional name. Once I get the job, um, I'm not going to go by Cin Cynthia, I'm gonna go by Cindy. But when I have my resume, I want the more formal name. Um, that doesn't mean every single name that's a nickname is is the curse of or kiss of death. Um, I'm just saying you're you're not going to go wrong if your name has a more formal version that people are going to be able to pronounce easily. And we'll talk about maybe names that are more difficult to pronounce. Um, it's probably better to go with that more formal version of the name for your resume for your cover letter, and after you're hired or perhaps even in your interview to let them know the more informal name that you prefer. You can um, then use a street address, a physical address. You don't have to, though. Um, it's kind of a whatever you think in this category. Uh, if you're looking to save space, though, this is an area you can save space. Uh, the reality is that the employer is not going to write you a snail mail letter. They're gonna, this is all going to be done through email, so they don't really need to know where your address is. Uh, leaving off your um, physical address kind of communicates a level of sophistication about how resume hand handling happens these days and also a technological sophistication. This can subtly send a signal, especially if you're a more mature person that, you know, hey, I know how things are done now. I'm not back in the 1980s or 1990s in terms of, of these types of style things. So it's not wrong to list your address. If you've got enough space, you know, go ahead and do it. 
but if you're looking for a way to save space, cutting off your address can be a good approach. You're going to want to have your address probably on your cover letter because you're going to have, um, you know, your your um, letterhead with your contact information. So you know, you're not trying to keep it a secret, but does it have to be on your resume? I don't think so. You want to have your phone number on here. Um, there's only need to have one. Obviously, you're going to have to monitor that phone pretty carefully. Um, you may want it to be, if you have a landline, your landline, or perhaps your cell. Um, but you'll have to be aware, you know, uh, many times people screen, their, particularly their cell numbers. You have to be, while you're looking for the job, answering telephone numbers that you don't recognize because, again, that may be from the law firm or maybe from that person's personal cell phone number. So you can't assume that it's a solicitor because you don't recognize the number. You want to have a professional email address, and this is something that you can develop yourself. Um, you know, and again, just because you're establishing, you know, a Gmail or Ymail account for this purpose, it doesn't mean that you actually have to constantly be going into that account. You can have those emails forwarded to another account that is maybe your real email account. Um, but you want to have something that um, identifies you as a professional that presents that correct image. Um, so you don't want to have something like, you know, I love bunnies dot hotmail dot com. That's not the image that you want. Um, I have some examples in the next one we'll go to. It's a smart idea to have a website. Um, it could be your own website or it could just be your LinkedIn profile. Uh, and by the way, if you haven't established your LinkedIn profile, you need to when you're uh, ideally before you are um, ready to uh, start looking for a job. But if, if you have it beforehand, definitely at the time. Um, a LinkedIn account does several things for your job search effort. Um, as you progress in your career, you will see that having a well put together LinkedIn uh, uh, profile will actually get you inquiries. I get um, information, I mean employers seek me out pretty regularly saying, hey, you might be a good fit for our job. Um, so uh, at some point in your career you may well find you don't have to look for a job, it's going to find you because you've got a, a sharp looking LinkedIn account. Um, Another thing that LinkedIn profile can do for you is that it can allow you to make all of those connections, all those links. And so it's not just the people you know, but you also have contacts to people, to, to the contacts of your, your contacts. And so maybe you start out only having 50 contacts, but each one of those contacts has 50 contacts that you don't already have. And so really, you know, you've got, um, you know, 2,500 people right now that you can reach out to because of, of the, the interconnectedness and even go beyond that. So those are links to potential um, jobs, to potential openings. Another good thing about a LinkedIn profile is that it communicates to that potential employer, hey, I know how this works. I'm a professional. Um, I, I know the drill. You can trust me because I know how the, the uh, professional person presents himself or herself. Simply having a LinkedIn account that is reasonably well done communicates that. Not having it kind of suggests a little bit of an amateurness. And again, that undercuts the argument that you are um, well organized and detail oriented and all that good stuff. Um, it's hard to make that argument if you don't have a LinkedIn account. Um, it also allows the employer to confirm this stuff in your resume. About a third of all resumes, studies indicate, are filled with some just flat out whopper lies. But the idea is that if, if you have, or if you're including the same information in your LinkedIn account that is on your resume, the odds of having a really whopper lie is diminished because your LinkedIn profile is, is public your family and friends and colleagues are going to be able to see it. And if you're saying things like, you know, you were the Tsarina of Russia, and you, in fact, were not the Tsarina of Russia, um, it's embarrassing. And most people aren't willing to put just really, really exaggerated claims in their LinkedIn account. So employers know that. And so they will be looking for uh, correlating what is in your resume with your LinkedIn account. So all of those are reasons why you want to use a LinkedIn account. But one more reason is that you can put a link 
um, it, once you establish your LinkedIn account, which by the way is free, don't ever pay for it, um, but, but once you have that LinkedIn account, there's a way to actually have a link that you can put on your resume that will direct your uh, a potential employer to your LinkedIn account. And that communicates, hey, not only do I have a LinkedIn account, but I have the technological know-how to, to set this up so that you can easily access it. And this can be especially important, again, if you're a more mature person. It's, it's uh, put, dispelling the concern that sometimes exists that maybe you aren't up on the latest technologies. On a separate note, as you probably know from other classes and other presentations, uh, Colin College has a LinkedIn group. It's called Colin College Para, Paralegal Association. Uh, LinkedIn has changed the way they do their groups. Um, they had some, I think, legal difficulties with some of the things. So there, it's harder to find now. Um, I'm going to work on seeing ways that I can make it easier to find, but um, if I'm not successful or, or I'm not successful in the short term, one way that you can always do is you can establish your account, link with me, and again, you'll find me under Cynthia Ferris Groover, and let me know that you want an invitation. So let me know. So you would send me a LinkedIn request. You want an invitation to Collin College Paralegal Association. And then because I'm the administrator of the group, I will send you an invitation. And all you have to do is then accept the invitation and you are now a member of the group. We have over 300 members and that is where we post all the job leads that we get. Um, so it's an important uh, thing for you to consider doing. You're not required to do it. It's not a, a mandatory thing, but it really helps you know um, where the jobs are. We, we also post other pieces of information. So uh, please consider doing that. If you don't want to link with me within um, uh, LinkedIn after you get the invitation you're welcome to unlink with me you won't hurt my feelings I promise unfortunately I can't send you an invitation to the group unless we're linked with each other um, so uh, don't consider it a lifelong commitment just link with me however long you'd like but you can once once I've, you've got the invitation you, you are certainly welcome to unlink okay so let's talk about um, that contact information section um, you um, probably are going to want to center the, inf uh, the information at the top of your resume. There's lots of different ways of centering, though, and you can be creative. Um, I have in the next page an example. I actually have everything centered. But you could have some stuff over here and some stuff over here. What I want is it, is it to be balanced in some sense. And this is the example of that LinkedIn address that you have. In this case, I haven't put a snail mail address. You definitely could. If you were to put a snail mail address, but you, you uh, are, are somewhat tight for space, you might want to do it where you have maybe Mary A. Smith here, and then you have telephone number and street address over here, then maybe email and LinkedIn address over here, so you're not eating up a ton of space on the top that you might want to use elsewhere. Might want to make the font a little bit bigger. Obviously, you want this to be eye-catching. Um, if, if you go by bubbles, you don't want that on your resume. Um, you'll want to have the more formal name. Um, you might be, maybe your mother named you bubbles. Um, under those circumstances, you may want to um, change it to a, a version of the name that might be more palatable. You might do B.A. Smith. Maybe your name is Bubbles Ann Smith. You might do B.A. Now, there's a downside to doing this because now it's unclear whether you are a, a man or a woman. Um, you know, you could um, look for ways of communicating that elsewhere in your resume. You could put you know, Ms. B.A. Smith, that's one way of approaching it. Uh, there may be something in your resume that makes it obvious that you are a woman, for example, maybe you were involved in the Junior League, and so obviously that communicates, you know, you're a woman. Uh, so th there, there is a potential downside to just using initials. Um, you'd have to kind of make a judgment call about uh, where you're going to come down there. Uh, with respect to that, let me go back here. Uh, you, you might, if your name is Bubbles Ann, you might want to go with this, B and then Ann 
So your B and so that again, this is going to communicate clearly. You're a woman, and then uh, you you prefer to go by your middle name. And again, once you get established there, you can say, you know what, I actually prefer Bubbles, and everyone can call you Bubbles. Then once you have the job, it's perfectly fine to go by Bubbles. It's just getting that job that you want to work with something a little bit more uh, professional sounding. And again, you want to use an email address that is easy for the employer to use and that presents you professionally. So you don't want to use one that has O, the letter, uh, the, the, the capital letter O, or even lowercase O, that can be confused with a zero. So let's say that um, instead of having a one, two, three, maybe you had a, um, 001. That's not the best choice because is this a letter um, O or is this a number zero? Um, you, you don't want to make that up in the air because if the employer chooses incorrectly, um, the, the email will probably bounce back and the employer may not see that it bounces back or may just not be sufficiently invested in you as a candidate to resend it. Your job is to make it as easy as possible to be found. So if you can figure out a way to present your email address or to develop an email address that doesn't have either zeros or um, uh, O's in it, that's a smart thing. And again, you don't want to use something cutesy. You want to use something with your name. It can be with periods or without periods. It can have numbers in it as long as it's not an, an O. Um, you don't want to use um, AOL. You want something like Gmail, Ymail, um, or something that communicates that you know, this is an email that you've had for the last 30 years. Um, so don't use um, AOL, but otherwise, you know, use, use what you want. So if you have questions about your contact example, please note them down or write them down now and we can talk about them in class. Let's go to our next section, which is the objective. My recommendation, as I said before, this is a little bit of a controversial subject, but my recommendation is keep your objective really, really short. Um, many times people will put a paragraph in as an objective or a summary. Um, the problem with that is, is in that three to five second window, Nobody's going to read it. And if they start reading it, they won't read the really important stuff on your resume. And you don't want them to waste that precious time reading something that doesn't really get you anywhere. Most of the time when I see summaries, they are self-congratulatory things. Proactive, self-starting, uh, uh, highly competent professional. Well, yeah, you think all those things are true about you. But really that's just your opinion and nobody thinks they're lazy and even if that person does think they're lazy they're not going to put it on the resume so it's what I call happy talk it doesn't really mean anything it sounds good but you know what nobody has gotten a job ever in the history of ever for saying oh, well I hired them because they said they were competent in the resume and nobody can lie on a resume so I knew they had to be competent never has happened that stuff um, it's not going to offend somebody, but it's not going to help you. And you have very little real estate. It's one piece of paper to make your sales pitch. So why would you waste that precious real estate on stuff that doesn't get you closer to getting the job? So my suggestion would be to stick it, use an objective as, as how you're going to phrase it, and keep your objective objective, not subjective. So if you're answering an ad that says experience law office paralegal for a busy two attorney office in North Dallas, this might be what your objective is. Family law paralegal position in North Dallas. That's what I want because that's why I'm applying to your job. You wouldn't have to be this specific. You could leave off North Dallas. That'd be fine too. Um, you know, so I'm not saying you have to be that specific, but you want to be pretty close. Um, now, you may think to yourself, well, why do I have to be that specific? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, it's kind of exciting if you're the employer, you say, wow, he wants my job. He, 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 he this candidate is looking for a job just like mine. Um, I mean, probably the employer is going to be savvy enough to realize you change the objective every time you apply for a job. But still, it's kind of a moment of, wow, perfect fit. Um, it's not going to hurt you. 
by, by having that kind of perfect fit. The other reason, this is a more practical uh, reason, is that the employer might have several openings and you want to make sure your resume gets into the right bucket. If somehow or another it gets into the wrong bucket, and that can especially happen when you don't have legal experience on your resume, and so I may think you're applying for the legal secretary position. But when you get in the wrong bucket, you're probably never, no one's probably going to worry about getting you back into the right bucket. You're just in the wrong bucket and no one's going to realize that and you don't get the interview for the job that you're not a good fit for and nobody really ever considered you for the right job because nobody in that law firm is looking out for you. You are the person who is looking out for you and so the, the, the more you can work to get into the right bucket so that people know, hey, I want this job, that's a good thing for you. And you notice I don't say anything about with with uh, with a potential for growth or that is going to permit me to use my excellent legal research skills no guess what the law firm doesn't care about your feelings they have work that needs to be done they care about getting the work done so they aren't focused on how are we going to help this person grow into the legal professional he or she wants to become? He or she, the, the, the law firm is thinking, we want to use this person. We don't want to abuse this person, but, but we want this person to do what we want them to do. And their personal growth and their sense of fulfillment is not what we're looking to accomplish right now. Once they become a part of our team, yeah, we'll want to help them grow, all that good stuff. But right now, they're not a part of our team. And so that other stuff about wanting to grow and all that good stuff, you may want that. That may be super important to you, but if that's not going to get you the job, if that's not going to get you where you want to be, why are you putting it on there? It doesn't fit. Okay. So here's an example of this resume. We have Daniel Warren. He has his telephone number. He has his email address, his LinkedIn profile, and he lists his objective as criminal law, paralegal position in Plano. This works. Now, depending upon your resume format, you may want your objective to be centered or you may want it to be left justified. Part of that's going to turn on, you're going to want to see it both ways and see how, how it works out best. I consider this part kind of the top part of the resume. Um, your actual uh, contact information is not going to change from resume to resume, but your objective is probably the part of your resume that's going to be most likely to change every time you submit a job. Because obviously, even if you're focused on criminal law, um, sometimes the, the position that you're applying for will describe its opening as a paralegal opening. Other times, they may describe the opening as a legal assistant opening or some other term. And you'll want to just use exactly the word that they're using. Now you may say, well, what's the difference between legal assistant and paralegal? In some markets, there is a, a somewhat of a difference between these terms. There are parts of the legal world where a legal assistant is a broader term that includes paralegals and also other legal professionals such as legal secretaries, legal file clerks, and other legal professionals who aren't attorneys. Um, in our market, though, legal assistant really is just a, a synonym for a paralegal. Before I came to work at Collin College, I, I came here at, in 2010, I um, knew I'd gotten the job and I was uh, completing my practice and I asked, asked several paralegals with whom I worked, what term do you prefer? Do you prefer paralegal or legal assistant? Um, and I got about 50-50 split, 50 like paralegal, 50 like legal assistant. I'll tell you honestly that I preferred the term legal assistant. To me, the term paralegal was not offensive, but not as polite as legal assistant. And the reason that I found paralegal disconcerting was that the term paralegal is an adjective. And people are nouns, people are an adjectives. And so I thought it was a little bit... Uh, slangy and formal and not as respectful uh, but legal assistant the term assistant is a noun and so it, to me that term seemed more respectful um, and I think many attorneys or, or, or some attorneys at least would share my reaction to that so when an attorney advertises a legal assistant job he doesn't know or she doesn't know that paralegal is the more preferred term 
Um, it's not something that we're told as, as attorneys. So don't read something into it. If you see a job advertised as legal assistant and assume, oh, that's going to be different than paralegal, it's probably exactly the same type of job. But what you'll want to do is you'll want to switch it out. And so if the job is for a criminal law a legal assistant, you didn't put criminal law legal assistant position in, in Plano in here instead. So match that up. Okay, so we've talked about the first um, section of the resume, the, the contact information and the objective. Now let's flip to our next section, which is uh, going to be education. So let's talk about um, the education section. Your education section will probably go next in your resume at this point in time. It should go next because the next portion is going to be uh, Close to the middle, but uh, you know, maybe in the in the in the uh, not in the top 25 percent, but in that second 25 percent zone. That's the area that is most likely to be seen in those three to five seconds. So you want your best stuff there, your most important stuff there, and before you have that first legal job, most likely your best stuff is going to be your education at Collin College. And once you get that first legal job, even if that first legal job is, you know, being a courier at the law firm, but is actually with a law firm, that's going to be your most important part. So you're going to flip your resume at that point and move your education down and put your job experience on top. But if your job experience right now is in a different industry, um, you're going to have that lower and you're still going to include it. It can still be useful, but it's not going to be as useful, as important as that education is going to be. Now, there can be a few other things that can bounce your education lower. For example, if you really are fluent in Spanish, that can trump your paralegal education, or at least potentially can trump your paralegal education, because bilingual um, legal professionals are very much in demand. If you have really awesome typing skills and have experience, as a as a as an executive secretary, for example, that also potentially can can flip your resume. You don't want to obviously you don't need to go to, to paralegal school to become a legal secretary, so that's not you, you don't, you're not looking for that particular job. But paralegals, especially in that first job, may well find themselves also being a legal secretary, or at least being responsible in crunch situations for typing up documents. So most of the time, you're going to start with your education. Um, and uh, once you get that first job, you'll flip it. OK, sometimes you, know, you may be in a position where I have a four-year degree from awesome university. Um, you are still going to want to put your paralegal education above that. You're going to want to include your four years at Awesome University, but you're going to have your paralegal stuff on top because that's the stuff that is relevant, most relevant to your job. Um, if so, so Collin College will be on top, and then Awesome University will be below that. If you haven't completed your paralegal education, you'll want to list your completion date. Now you may think, well, I don't want to list it because it's so far in the future. Um, you can be somewhat optimistic with your dates, uh, but it it communicates I have a plan. Um, it communicates you've thought this through. I'm organized. I'm detail-oriented. So have that completion date, even if it's early days in your plan. List the name of the credential that you're seeking. And ideally, list some courses relevant. Um, if it's your first semester and you've only taken one course, you don't need to list it. But once you, you get to the point of having probably um, maybe three courses, um, you'll want to go ahead and list them. Uh, a couple of reasons why you want to do this. First of all, it allows you to have more real estate on your resume devoted to your paralegal education. And when you don't have any legal job, you want to put as much stuff there as possible so it becomes more and more difficult for that potential employer to somehow miss seeing it. Second of all, a course list allows you to use bullets, and bullets are interesting for the eyes. Eyes are drawn to the bullets, so you're going to see that stuff, and it also adds that kind of visually interesting component to the document. 
if you have an even number of courses, and so let's say you get to the fourth course, um, you're also going to be able to use two columns of bullets. And that, again, adds more interest, and it shows that you have some, some word skills that are useful. So those are reasons why you uh, want to list courses if you can. Do you have to? No. If your resume is really on the edge of not fitting on the page and you really don't want to cut anything else out, you don't have to include it. But it's definitely something to consider. Do you want to list your GPA or not? Um, I think if your GPA is below 3.3, you probably don't. I'm going to tell you something. I hope that you do really, really well academically in our program. I am cheering for you to do that. And I think it is useful for you to do well academically. But it's not so much useful for you to do well academically because having a higher GPA is going to result in a lot more job offers. The reason you want to do well academically is that the information you're learning in this program, if you really, really learn it, if you master it, it's going to help you get jobs and it's going to help you keep jobs. But the actual GPA number doesn't really get you a lot of jobs. Um, now, if you have a four point or three nine or three eight, I mean, I don't mean to say it's 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 not a good statistic, but I don't want you to focus on, oh, I've got to have the highest GPA ever. You want to learn the stuff. The GPA is an imperfect measurement, but it is a, a, a decent measurement of how much you've mastered the material. So when you get the A in that course. Don't think to yourself, ah, that means my GPA is great and that means it's more like I'm getting a job. No, the way to think about it is, well, I must have really mastered most of the material, which means that I'm going to be able to go into that job interview and talk really uh, with a lot of expertise about that subject. And if I practice in that area, I'm going to be able to do very well in that subject. It's a measurement of your mastery of the material. But you may want to consider it if you have a strong GPA. I'd say if you were three five or higher, I'd probably stick it in there if you can find the space for it. If you have distinctions like dean's list or earn any scholarships, uh, consider doing that as well. Again, uh, you want this th this section of your resume, especially before you have that first paralegal job, to be really noticeable. And so you want to make that as big and as interesting and as kind of front and center as you can have. Even once you get that first legal job, uh, you are still going to want to make this a, a pretty significant part of your resume. So it doesn't go away that you want to have some space devoted to your education here. Okay, so if you have a four-year degree or another two-year degree, that's going to go right below Collin College. Um, mo in most cases, your, re your uh, major isn't going to be that relevant, so you, you can list it. Um, it you probably will list it, but you don't need to go into extra coursework or extracurricular activities or things along those lines. Um, if you have a, a two-year degree and it's in a different field, let's say you um, got a two-year degree in uh, uh, hotel management. Well, that may point or that may communicate a couple of things that aren't as positive. Um, and so it's worthy considering do I want to include a lot of information about that. Uh, one thing that happens is that, you know, nobody gets a, a um, degree in hotel management with the plans of becoming a paralegal. So it points to somebody who's made a switch. Now, many, 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 most, I would say, paralegal students are second career folks. So having a first career is not a bad thing. But especially if your, your first degree isn't very long ago, it's going to look like you're kind of indecisive. It's going to look like maybe you aren't fully committed to being a paralegal, or maybe you're still exploring this other career path. It also kind of undermines the idea that you're super competent, super well organized, super focused, and, and, and all those kinds of things. So it sends a bit of a mixed message there. Um, listing the credential, you could certainly do that, but you might not want to list a major that isn't a good fit. You don't need to list any high school graduation information. Obviously, you had to have graduated from high school in order to be attending college, and so that's a wasted line on your, on your resume, and I would encourage you to just put, take that off and not list it. Here's an example of how you might want to do um, your um, education, and you can see here I'm using italics up here, and I'm using bold for the college. 
um, I'm using some bulleting. I did not you do a two column, but certainly if I added, say, a course, I could do a two column and that would be nice. Um, this works nicely depending upon your credentials. Um, again, these are the types of things you're looking for. Another thing I've done is I've indented. You can see I have some indentations. You're going to want to follow the same pattern that you do with your education for all of your education. So if I had a college, I mean a four-year university, I want to have that its name lining up with Collin College. I want to have it italicized and in bold. Then I want to have the city and state of that of that school and the dates of, of attendance. Um, and then I, I again I'd want to make it as as consistent as possible. I won't have courses obviously for that, but I'd want to list at least the degree that I had. I wouldn't have to list my GPA. You want to have it consistent. Then when you get to the uh, work experience, very likely you want to have the same structure. So you'll want to have it look consistent throughout the document, and um, you know want to play with that and try different approaches to make sure it's a good fit. I'm going to end this lecture at this point, and in the next lecture we'll talk about um, how to present work work experience and other issues. Thank you for your attendance and I look forward to um, having you attend the next video.